Professor Holler got his uh, bachelor's degree at Kearney State University. Um, then he went on to Northwestern University and worked with uh, Professor Robert Burwell, um, where he received his PhD. And then he moved on to uh, Oxford University, uh, where he got a NATO postdoctoral fellowship. From there, he went on to Yale University, and uh, he was named Professor of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, in, in 1980, he received full professorship, and now I guess they've changed some things, and Professor of Chemical Engineering and Chemistry. Um, Professor Holler, um, you don't have to be working too long in, in uh, support of Metal Catalyst to, to realize the impact of the work that uh, Professor Holler's done. I know when I was in school, there was a lot of controversy over what was really going on with this titanium supported catalyst. And it's really a, a lot of work that came out of Professor Holler's lab that really um, cleared that up and, and really uh, settled a lot of that controversy. And um, so it was. Uh, and so now that with things like SMSI become second nature to catalyst chemists. Uh, Professor Holler has also um, been on, served with uh, past chair of the Division of Colloid and Surface Science for the American Chemical Society, uh, served uh, quite extensively with the Catalysis Society as foreign secretary, vice president, and president, and now he's the general chair of the 11th International Congress of Catalysis, which is going to be held in Baltimore. For Many of his, all this, of his significant contributions, Professor Holler has also been named this year's uh, uh, Robert Burwell Lecture in Catalysis that is an uh, award given by Amico Oil and the uh, uh, North American Catalysis Society. Um, today, Professor Holler is going to speak on uh, physical and chemical characterization of mesoporous molecular sieve materials. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I want to start with an apology. I'm going to have to leave right after lunch, and I don't like to do that, but, I, but my obligations in New Haven uh, have to do with the Yale alumni, and they're a hard group to say no to. For the, about the last decade, I have uh, been involved in administration, and in that period, uh, among other things, the administration tried to do away with engineering, and uh, uh, so I've been given something called the Meritorious Service Award. I suppose that's from, from just resisting in that battle. But what that means is I have to dash home uh, to, to a dinner and to give another talk this evening in New Haven, and so I'm going to leave right after lunch. So I, I apologize ahead of time for not being able to stay for your full meeting. Secondly, Steve already mentioned something that I had intended to, to, to bring some new brochures on, the 11th ICC in Baltimore uh, next uh, July 1996. You should have all received the first mailing because it went out to every member of the Catalysis Society, and I must assume that you all are members of the Catalysis Society. Uh, the second mailing is now ready, and, uh, and I intended to bring a stack of those, uh, but I didn't. Uh, all you need to do is sometime before June 1st is send in the pre-registration form. And if you haven't done that, write me or Kathy Taylor, General Motors, who's the secretary, and get one of those forms and, and, and pre-register. With that, you'll get uh, information on how to fill out the uh, long abstract uh, submission and uh, other materials. There'll only be one more uh, mailing which will have the final program and uh, um, registration materials. So please, uh, if you haven't done uh, fill out one of those. Well, as already uh, announced, uh, I'm going to talk on the subject of mesoporous molecular sieves, and this is a, a Burwell lecture. Uh, in fact, it's the, my first verbal lecture, so probably I will uh, uh, be doing uh, some revision. Uh, but uh, I wanted to start by making a few comments about my interactions with uh, Robert Burwell. As already was noted, I got my degree working with him. But uh, uh, probably things that you don't know that I, I'd like to know is how I got to know him. Uh, I came to the Northwestern uh, graduate program uh, with admission in both math and chemistry. And in fact, at the time, I thought I was going to do a PhD in mathematics. But the chemist, uh, I guess that actually was uh, Ralph Pearson who suggested I get into more important science than that I studied chemistry. <laughs> and uh, the first thing that happened to do that was that, that uh, I never had physical chemistry, so I had to take remedial physical chemistry with the, the undergraduate. And the person who taught that course was Robert Burwell. And I found uh, uh, a very Joyful class, and he was forever using some uh, Rothschild wine as his working fluid for his thermodynamic or, or various other es esoteric approaches. 
The other thing was, well, so, so I decided that yes, I was interested in physical chemistry, even though I, I was having to do remedial physical chemistry, and more particularly that I would like to do catalysis, and so I uh, ended up with, uh, doing my work with uh, Barrow And at that time, he had a, a whole stable of postdocs, but he only had one student. I was his only student at the time. And so I would see him roughly every day and for about an hour, and it would take us a few minutes to get past whatever questions I had about the chemistry, but we'd spend another hour where he was trying to educate me on history, art. <laughs> I had no idea what a drag that was on his time. I mean, <laughs> later on, when I had students, the idea of giving each one of them an hour a day is just incomprehensible. I mean, they were lucky to get an hour, but uh, a week. Uh, so, so for that, I, I really have to be most appreciative. And then I have to point out that even though it's been it's approaching 30 years since I left Northwestern, he hasn't given up on me. He's, he's, he's still trying to give me a, an education. And so whenever we meet at meetings, we, we do something. This was the Gordon Conference last year, and he wanted to, to uh, lecture me on and say good on sculpture. And so there's a, uh, if you haven't done it, this is a Wonder Museum, very near uh, New London. And so he took me over there, and we picked up a few other people along the way. Uh, this is the uh, Yale contingent, Terry Balsman and, and Bob, Bob Weber. That's very well, of course. They have Kumit Ossipuskin and Ohio State and Brian Dick from Columbia. And then last summer when we were out for the birthday party at, uh, for Michelle Bedard, we did our wine thing. And so this is a rich winery. Uh, I actually took him there, but of course, it, like happened so, so, so many places. I invite him to take him, but then once I get in there, he tells me what I want to see. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's been a very fruitful relationship, and probably I've learned much more in areas having not to do with chemistry than I have in areas of chemistry very well. But, but the things that he's taught me about chemistry are not insubstantial either. So it's a great pleasure to be very well liked because of the particular lecture, uh, because of the particular relationship I've had with him for so many years. Okay, uh, let me start this discussion. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to tell you essentially two stories. Uh, they, they are projects that we had going on in our laboratories having to, to do with trying to understand the relationship between structure, local structure, and multisilica aluminous. And, and their uh, acid catalysis. And another one having to do with the uh, interaction of platinum particles with l zeolite for the indexing uh, aromatization reaction. These were two projects that were going on in my laboratory at the time that I first heard about the mobile mesial force collective SIDS. And so what I want to try to do is give you a little background on those two projects and then try to tell you how we think these new mesial force materials will have a They'll probably have some good industrial applications, but a good academic uh, application where because you can continuously vary the pores and have a very regular array of pores, you can ask some questions having to do with other problems, and, and particularly the one that I want to talk about is structure, city relationship, silicon and, and metal support interactions having to do with small plastic particles and parallel pores. I, I almost surely you heard about uh, the mobile materials that were first uh, 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 discussed uh, in the 1991-1992, though the patents predate those uh, a year or so. The, the materials are made by using a long chain alkyl uh, surfactant, uh, say 16, uh, trimethyl uh, ammonium with an alkyl that is, is very blink. Those particular materials have the property that they form micelles in, in solution under certain pH conditions that are not spherical micelles, but, but they form um, um, rods, uh, micellar rods. And there have been mobile just given two proposals to how that ends up making a, a structured silica or silica alumina. In one case, the thought is that these micellar rods arranged in a hexagonal array and then you precipitate silicate or silica alumina on the surface of that salt <coughs> on solution. You calcine them, and that burns out the organic uh, material that's in the pores, and you end up with a product which is a regular array of, of, of par parallel channels. There's another possibility, which is uh, that, in fact, you, you actually precipitate on the mislid rods, and then they aggregate, and they, they 
uncertainty. There's at least a third possibility, and that is that this final structure doesn't actually happen in solution. Now, quite often in our hands, we, uh, while we get the same final materials, the material that comes out of solution will not be hexagonal, but cubic. And it's only in thermal treatment that it's converted to this, this cubic array. So what the actual mechanism here is, is not something that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Mark Davis at Caltech has actually spent quite a bit of time trying to elucidate the mechanism of the synthesis. My interest in these materials is the fact that you can get parallel channels where you can systematically change the core uh, diameter. And the way you do that is change the alkyl uh, chain length. Uh, if you, you can vary it, well, the ones that I'm going to talk about today use alkyl links from C6 to C16. So you're changing the di diameter of this uh, micelle where the charged part, of course, is the outside and the uh, hydrophobic part, uh, the organic part, is Center. And so it's a, a way of systematically varying the pore diameter. And so the two problems that I want to address have to uh, try to take advantage of that property to see how the pore diameter affects acidity and platinum metal uh, interaction. These materials, if you look uh, at them, and uh, either by X-ray diffraction or pure electron diffraction, give you a hexagonal pattern, which is the result of the fraction uh, from the regular wall spacing. But the wall material, which is uh, uh, silico silica aluminum and very thin, of over 10 angstroms, is itself essentially amorphous. So they're, 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 they're pseudo crystals. <coughs> they have regular uh, order uh, at orthogonal <coughs> pores, but if you look along the pores, uh, and look, there's no diffraction uh, in that dimension. Um, and you can get these nice electron micrographs. This is one from. Uh, from mobile again, where you can, and, and there's been some published since then, where, where you can actually see these pores really do have a hexagonal shape. That's a marker of 50 angstroms. And so these are pores that are of order 40 angstroms or so. And they're fairly easy. Fairly, the chemistry is fairly simple. It's rather easy to make them. Okay, now, let me now give you a little background on this question of, uh, that I want to look at, which has to do with uh, trying to use these materials to learn something about structure and acidity in silica aluminum. Uh, in fact, I think the last time that I had the opportunity to talk at uh, a tri-state meeting, uh, I actually talked about this, a, uh, the thesis of Che um, Yun Lin, which has to do with these correlations. And the idea is that, that, uh, that uh, the acidity depends on the partial charge on silica and that, that I can twiddle that partial charge on silicon in two different ways. I can change this silicon oxygen aluminum bond angle, and when I do that, I change the degree of SP hybridization, which changes the, the, the partial charge on silicon. Or if I look at the Dick's nearest neighbors, where these P can be either silica alumina, I can affect the part of partial charge by, by uh, what the nature of that mixed nearest neighbor is. As, as I change this from silicon to aluminum, in fact, I will make this charge smaller and the acidity goes down. So it, as you all know, if you get the highest acidity, you're better off if you can sort of isolate the aluminum. And, and you can't really control this angle in amorphous materials. You get some average uh, one, but in, in a zeolite structure, you actually can fix it. And so what he, the summary of his whole dissertation is sort of given in this one plot. We have a measure of acidity, which I'll tell you about in a minute. It's selectivity between 2-methyl-2-pentene and 4-methyl-pentene in the reaction of 2-methyl-pentene. We have a measure of partial charge on the silicon, which is essentially the chemical shift of NMR and silicon-29. And for a large number of materials, we find a correlation between the acidity measured catalytically and this partial charge that goes, that goes like this. One could even understand why there's so much scatter having to do with, with the way these were made in the sense that the NMR averages over ever silicon in the sample, but of course the catalysis only averages over the exposed silicon. And I'll come back to this in a minute, but I want to just uh, explain these, these two axes. We've used a variety of chemical reactions to test for acidic cumin fracking, ammonia absorption, um, purity and absorption in the infrared. But the one that I like the best was actually developed in Exxon, and it's this reaction of 2-methyl-2-pentene. 
which can undergo either a double bomb shift, which essentially any old, any old acid site will, will cause, or it can undergo a methyl shift. Uh, both of them are isomerizations, but this one has a higher activation energy and takes stronger acidity. And the nice thing about it, or at least it, it, qualitative, is that we, what we want is not to, to have a, uh, a convolution of acid strength and acid density. We'd like to have a measure of acid strength alone. And in almost any of these measures you have, you're usually looking at a convolution of those. The way that, you, that we think we can get around it here is the fact that if every acid site, weak, strong, or otherwise, caused this reaction, but only the very strong acid sites cause this reaction, then by looking at the ratio of the selectivity to this to this, you would be normalizing the acidity of the strong sites to the total acidity, all site density. And so that ratio is kind of a, 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 a chemist measure of acid strength. And that's the, that's the as it were, y-axis here. The three methyl, two pentene, normalized four methyl pentene, so that we take that to be acid strength, not acid density, or at least we, we, we try to normalize that out. The correlation, the calculation of the partial charge comes from NMR work. A lot of it is in the literature, but I take an example from Alex Bell here, where taking ligmers or uh, small uh, <coughs> molecules of silicone where you actually know the structures, you can measure their chemical shifts, and you can calculate the partial charge and see that it really doesn't matter how you change the partial charge, that there is an uh, empirical correlation between that partial charge and the chemical shift. For example, let's just look at a trigger moment here. If we, if we take this point here, the, the closed ones are silicates, the open ones are silica luminous. So in the case where we have a linear uh, uh, species, uh, that's that particular one, chemical shift, partial charge. If I change the structure but keep the composition the same, I move from here to here, staying on the correlation. On the other hand, if I if I keep the structure constant, triangular, but but replace one of the silicons for alumina, then I move back down to here. So I can, well, it really doesn't matter from a, the NMR's point of view how I change the partial charge. I I I am sorry. How I uh, yes change the uh, chemical shift. The, the, the real effect is the measurement of the part of the charge, which then allows us to do this correlation here. This is obtained from the uh, NMR to get this correlation between acidity and partial charge. Now, the, the, the relationship between acidity and structure, that I think <coughs> there are two parts of that. One is the one I've talked about, which is composition and mixed air behavior. But the most important effect on acidity has to do with this, this silicon oxygen aluminum bond effect. This has been, this was the first one that was published. It's uh, one where they, they did not allow the bond links to, uh, to adjust when they did the calculation. So it, it's a fairly crude calculation. But subsequent work, say, by Van Sant, he, he's actually allowed the, the, the bond link to change. And in qualitatively, you get the same result. What you find here is energy against that bond angle and doing it for two species, the protonated uh, bridging hydroxyl, which goes through a well and then back up, and the deprotonated, which is pretty, uh, when we go from 180 degrees towards uh, something like 90 degrees, uh, is pretty flat and then shoots up. And so the acidity is determined by the difference between these. It's the energy it takes to release a proton. So if I, if I open that, of course, for a tetrahedral angle, I ought to be down here to 109. That's uh, a fairly weak. Acid. But as I move out to 180, if I can lock the structure out in a more open one, I'll have higher acidity. And in fact, you can kind of understand qualitatively why we say L zeolite is a basic zeolite and mordenite is a, is a acidic zeolite, because you look at the average angle in those zeolites, and they will just be ordered that way. Now, the problem is that if you push it too far, it doesn't work, because if I look at ZSM5, it has 28 different silicon oxygen aluminum bond angles. Which one am I going to pick out here? It's you know, a bit of a problem. All right, so now I guess I can, I'm at the point where I can tell you about what, what our first idea was. So our idea was that if I had, if we have very small pores and the wall thickness is essentially constant and thin, so that every, essentially every silicon or every aluminum is on the, on the surface, 
Then, as I change the pore size, I'm going to change this radius to curvature, and to sort of wrap silicon oxygen aluminum around there, I'm going to systematically do something to the bond angles. I don't know exactly what that's going to be. And it turns out when you look at it more carefully, it's not just how you wrap them around, but the amorphous silicon aluminum form ring structures, which also depend on this radius of curvature. So it's going to be more complicated than this original idea. But what we wanted to do was to fix the composition and then vary the pore size and fix the pore size and vary the composition and see if we can uncouple this composition and structural parameters to a city. That was the bit. So we made a grid of materials where it had six different pore sizes and five different compos compositions. We actually made lots more. The original grid was that. And then we were going to look at the acidity across, across that. So I'm going to tell you something about the characterization that we have performed on those, some of the partial success we've had in, in, in correlating the structure with acidity, and uh, that will be our topic for the next few minutes. So I, we have any number of, of these TEMs of our materials. Uh, this is, is one. We also do uh, 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 x-ray diffraction. So our typical analysis of a sample is to do TEM, uh, uh, x-ray diffraction, infrared on, on the material, silicon 29 NMR, aluminum 27 NMR, uh, some of the catalysis we usually do in nitrogen absorption, uh, benzene absorption, and, um, and uh, then we do uh, two methyl pentene reaction. That's kind of the whole list of things. I'm not going to tell you about all of that. I'm going to pick you a, a few uh, ex examples as we go along. Uh, so I'll start out by just saying, well, do we still see these correlations that we talked about? And this is the this is where we're measuring the acidity as a function of composition percent silica. And this is at a fixed pore size of, a, uh, of about 40 angstroms. And what we observe is the acidity seems to go up as we add aluminum. Well, that's no surprise. We, we, we don't have any essentially any acidity when we have 100% silica. So we expect this added aluminum acidity goes up. But then it comes down again. And, 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 and why is that? Well, we'll see in a minute why that is. But, but if we then look at what happens to the average chemical shift, it more or less does the same thing before. That is, the, if we take the, and I'm sorry, this is percent silica, and, and now I offset this, it's the mean chemical shift, uh, which is the green, more or less mapping out uh, the red, which is the acidity. That, that point looks off the correlation. In fact, you can understand it. It has to do with the uh, relaxation types of aluminum. If, if, when you have very small, amounts of aluminum isolated in the silica, it has a long relaxation time, and, and so, you, so you, you can actually rationalize why that point is way up there rather than down here. It has to do with the distortion of, of the speed. Uh, but I don't want to overemphasize that because, in fact, the silicon 29 is, is a very complicated spectrum. It's not like in zeolites which you get individual peaks. You actually have to massage it a lot. Here, here we're looking at now uh, a constant composition, uh, silicon aluminum ratio 16, this is the silicon 29 NMR, and we're looking at this as a function of pore size, where the pore size went from about 40 angstroms down to 15 angstroms, where the alkyl chain length of the surfactant is being varied. Now, this overall line shape looks very much like amorphous silica aluminum. But there's a whole lot of silica in here that's silica rich, and the chemical shift <coughs> is already way removed from where it would be from pure silica. Silica would be at about 110. And the problem is that, 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 that most of the silica here is surface silica, and a lot of it's terminated in OH. So you have two or three contributions to this downfield shift. One is you replace silicon through aluminum. That moves you down in this direction. If you have, uh, if you have silicon that is not branched to another OSI, but, but uh, bonded to OH, that also moves you down here. And then if you have a distribution of those, you get these, these complicated structures. I'm not going to say much more about the silicon NMR because, in fact, that's our least complete analysis. There's something called the maximum entry, entropy method, which will allow you to try to deconvolute these, hopefully objectively, into, in, into uh, the different components. And it, what we want for our correlation, if we could get it, is just the slice in here, which happens to be the chemical shift of those uh, aluminums that are bound to, uh, to, to a silicon, and then, and then the silicon is bound to, to four other silicons. In other words, we'd like to have the isolated silicon, sorry, isolated aluminum 
where, where it has the strongest acidity, and then that chemical shift that we like. The one that I actually showed you, which is the correlation, was obtained by just subtracting off the silica portion and then just looking at the peak maximum. It seems to work, but it's not the ideal way of doing this. Another kind of analysis that you can get is, is from the infrared. This is a uh, work that um, was done at Union Carbide where they <coughs> looked at a full range of, of, uh, of uh, zeolites and concluded that you could actually assign these peaks here to the asymmetric stretch of tetrahedral units, uh, the symmetric stretch of those tetrahedral units. And then these out here have to do with the connection between the tetrahedral of the rings, the bendings, and the cord. So this, this if we concentrate on this, this is essentially the asymmetric stretch of the T O O O tetrahedral unit, and it doesn't really matter what happens after that. So in these materials that, that are amorphous, that very local structure, the, the fundamental tetrahedral unit might be something <coughs> of, of, of some interest. And I, I just want to point out that, that there's enough local structure that if I look at a, at a, a real amorphous material like the silica alumina, in this range of the asymmetric stretch, there's not much detail. On the other hand, if I look at something like uh, that's crystalline, like uh, Y zeolite or L zeolite, I see rather sharp peaks in, in, this, in this region, the, the orange one here and the green one. And in fact, if I look at the pure silicon MCM material, rather sharp peaks too. So that in that sense, in the infrared for that tetrahedral union, the, the, uh, the, the amorphous silica alumina that's in the walls of this material looks, I would say, more like a zeolite than this amorphous uh, silica alumina. As everybody who's dealt with these materials has experienced, uh, it, it's harder to make the materials that have very small pores. And one way you can see that is just looking at the pure constant silica alumina ratio, uh, a pure silica material, which uh, was C14, is this one here. And then these here all have the same silica alumina ratio, but they have pore sizes 60, uh, say 40 to 50 nanometers. And what you see is that you go along, that structure sort of gets washed out. When you try to make the smaller pore material, it's hard to keep them crisp. Uh, you can see it in the X-ray diffraction. You can see it in the in, in the uh, trans, uh, transmission electrical micrographs also. If we just plot that one peak, which is the asymmetric stretch of the temporal unit, in, in a zeolite, in Y, if we change the uh, silica alumina ratio, the structure stays the same, and that does something very systematic. The, the uh, shift is to, towards uh, lower, sorry, to, towards higher frequency as I, as it were, uh, replace uh, uh, silicon with aluminum. Right? We're looking at the silica uh, 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 aluminum uh, ratio here. And, 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 that, and the reason for that is understood because if I pluck out the silicon and put in aluminum, the aluminum has a longer bond uh, than, than the silicon, and, and it has a greater formal charge plus four, plus a lower plus, uh, formal charge plus three rather than, than plus four. But I keep the structure the same, and so I get a, a sort of systematic change uh, here, which I can understand in terms of that bond length and that formal charge. But the mesoporous materials in the same range actually change the, the frequency in just the opposite direction. And then it does something funny and turns around. Well, I want to try to understand both this one and this one. And what I'm going to tell you or try to show you is that what's happening here, even though I'm doing the same operation, I'm replacing uh, 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 silicon for aluminum as I go in this direction, that what's happening is that in the case of the, uh, the amorphous materials or the mesial porous materials is that there's so much greater flexibility that yes, when I put aluminum in for silicon, the bond length gets greater, but at the same time, because I'm not in a locked structure, the bond angle changes, and that's the dominant effect, and that's the reason we go in this direction. And then when you get to this point, as we'll see from NMR, the problem is that here, most of the aluminum I'm putting in goes in to tetrahedral site, but if I try to put in too much aluminum, I find that most of it is just coming out as, as uh, octahedral aluminum, and that's what's happening over here. So this, of course, is one of the, the, the first complications to my, my simple picture I had, right? I was going to fix the composition and systematically vary the pore size, or for that matter, I was going to fix the pore size by the alkyl chain link and systematically change the composition. 
Well, it doesn't work quite that way. Here's a case where I, I fixed the uh, pore size. It's, it's all C16. But by x-ray diffraction, the pore diameter, which should have been on about 40 angstroms, isn't constant, right? And in fact, by x-ray diffraction, pure silica had, I think, a 42 angstrom or 43 angstrom diameter. And then as I added alumina, uh, the pore changed dramatically. And then it sort of leveled off here. So, and, the, and, and notice the order of magnitude of the pore size here. The pore size is changing uh, about five angstroms over this composition. If you took silica uh, Y zeolite and extracted lumen and, and tried to change the silica lumen ratio the same thing, the same amount, the, the cell size for Y zeolite would change an order of magnitude smaller, right? It would change about half an angstrom over the whole range of composition. But these much more flexible materials change five angstroms. And, and the, why is it changing so much here and le leveling off? Because over here, essentially, I'm plucking the silicon out and putting aluminum in. That's linking the bond, which ought, you might think ought to make the pores wider. But it's also changing the bond angle, and that's overriding that. And it's the bond angle that's, that's determining this contraction of the pore size up to this point. And only up to that point, because beyond that point, the aluminum is not going in in tetrahedral uh, sites. So now we've switched to aluminum 27 NMR, and uh, this peak that's around zero, our reference is, is, is a octahedral aqueous uh, of, of aluminum, that would be uh, our chemical shift zero. That's, that's, that's indicative of aluminum in octahedral environment. This is indicative of aluminum in tetrahedral environment. And over here, what I'm showing you is these are at constant pore size or constant alkyl length. But the composition is changing from very dilute in, in uh, silica. This is 5% by weight in aluminum, 10, 19, 31, 48, 55. And so as we put in a little alumina, all alumina origin initially goes into tetrahedral type. We can put in a little more, it's still tetrahedral, and up here to about 20% of the limit. And you probably put more alumina in, and now mostly it's going to octahedral. So that sort of gives you the explains both the infrared and the pore size factor, which changes dramatically up to about 20% aluminum, and then sort of levels off after that. And you can anticipate the, uh, the idea that if we're trying to make acid sites, we'd like the aluminum to go into the tetrahedral environment. Now, there's another complication. There are lots of little details that have to do with the synthesis. I had a very good student in, 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 who was able to do these. They're simple syntheses, but, but, but there are subtleties which one has to understand. And I'm going to tell you about one of the subtleties we've discovered, which we still don't understand. Uh, we've used two different, well, one more thing. You get better structures if you do, if you make uh, alkali preparations, sodium preparations. Uh, in other words, if you use as your sources sodium aluminate or sodium silicate, then you can get, uh, it's much easier to get crystalline materials well-spaced pores that diffract x-rays. If you try to make a non-alkali preparation, that's harder to, to do. Uh, and, and that's what we've been mostly interested in. Not only is it more difficult to do, but it, 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 it's, to, it's, it's affected by the alumina source. We've used two sources of alumina. Both of them are uh, bomite, pseudo-bomite. Uh, one is catapol, which is a traditional one that, that, that well, why did we use these particular sources of alumina? We wanted to use alumina which, is, uh, which has very little sodium impurity. It's the highest purity large scale alumina you can get, which is pure with respect to alkalis, are the materials that are commercially uh, produced as supports for reform catalysts. They, they, are, they are prepared in a way to make them sodium free because they're trying to make an acid uh, support for, the, for reform. Uh, the one that most people, I guess, have used is, is material that you get from catapult. Uh, catapult is a material which is formed by the hydrolysis of the isopropyl uh, uh, alpha oxide of aluminum. And then you get the pseudo-bomide, which when you calcify is gamma aluminum. Uh, American cyanamide, now I guess you should call it Cytec, or if you're actually buying from it, you have to call it Hyperion Catalyst. But those people, the original American cyanide, uh, uh, cyanamide uh, material was called PHF aluminum. 
It was also sodium free, used sodium free, but it's made a different way. There they start out with elemental amo uh, aluminum and dissolve it up in organic acid, usually acetic acid. So it's a different preparation, but in both cases you end up with pseudopolymer. By X-ray diffraction, by NMR, these materials look to be identical. But if you use them as a source of alumina, when you make an ISR, it says the tetrahedral octahedral alumina ratio. Actually, it's a fraction of tetrahedral that's actually plotted here as a fraction of percent alumina. So when we use the PHF alumina, we can initially synth synthesize these mesophores with all the aluminum in the tetrahedral environment. Uh, when we use what everybody else has used and what's in the mobile patents, the, the catapult, it, it's only a fraction. So you might expect these would be better acid catalysts than these. And then once you get to higher alumina contents, they, they seem not to be too different. And in fact, if I show you the difference between these two preparations, which are exactly the same except for this source of alumina, depending on how we measure uh, activity by cumin cracking or activity by this uh, two methyl two pentene, either the ratio or the initial rate of making three methyl two pentene or four methyl pentene, doesn't matter. Uh, the material which is made from the pH uh, F alumina, this one, which is by the student's code 177002, they're, five, they're all 5% alumina. This one is made from, uh, well, uh, from, from, from the, uh, well, here it is right here. Uh, this one is made from pH F cyanamide alumina, and this one is made from catapult, and there's an order of magnitude difference. And the reason is because the one source of alumina will be used a lot more. Why? I don't know. We've tried lots of things. One of our first thought was the PHF alumina is made, they throw in a little mercury to catalog the dozen of the element alumina. So maybe it's mercury uh, uh, period. But then we got some mercury free preparation that, that they, same thing, it doesn't make any difference. We, there are organic impurities, which are mostly acetic acid in the case of the PHF and, and, and mostly the propanate in the other case. But again, that seems not to be the same. So I don't know why it's different, but that's what I mean by there being subtleties. This is just one of them that you have to watch out for. You, 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 you just go in, you cook it up as the patent suggests, and out pops a product. Yeah, that part's easy, but what you actually have and how, how, how similar it is to the thing that Bert made that same day using the same process is something you have to be a little concerned about. Okay, now I'm gonna proceed to talk a little bit about the, 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 this uh, uh, tetrahedral versus octahedral alumina, but now as a function of pore size. So the first thing I want to, to, to demonstrate is that it really doesn't matter uh, what uh, pore size I make. That doesn't now from, from, from now on, we, we've stuck with PHF. We're trying to make uh, as much tetrahedral alumina as we can. And what I'm going to show you is that as synthesized, it doesn't matter what the pore size is. Here's C12, we've got all of these, but I'll just show you a couple of them. Uh, that up to about 20% uh, alumina, we can synthesize perfectly tetrahedral alumina, and then when we try to put more in, it, it, it doesn't work out so well. So that's C12, and I can overlay that with the, the same sets, but now uh, the C6, and I could actually put all of them up there. I mean, I we put C16, C14, and they would all look the same. So the, 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 the amount of the tetrahedral alumni I get in the synthesis is not affected by the pore size I'm trying to make. They're all the same. On the other hand, the stability of the tetrahedral alumina once I get it is a strong function of the pore size. So those were as synthesized. To make them catalyst, I'd have to burn the calcine them, burn out the template. And this is the case for C6. And of course, what happened, anybody who's done this knows that it's hard to keep the aluminum in the tetrahedral. Why is that? If you wanted to make, take the aluminum out of your YZ light, one standard way to do it is steam it at high temperature. Well, here we have lots of organic which we're burning out at high temperature. Essentially, you're steaming these materials. And I guess just to give it out of the way so that the question won't come later, why don't we take the template out for, uh, chemically? I dissolve it out with HCl and ethanol and then we can, we can dry calcine this and won't we? No, it turns out that all the chemistry is happening when we remove the template. In fact, we, we take out the templates at room temperature with using aqueous chemistry, you still 
turf convert the tetrahedral alumina into octahedral alumina. It's, it's not just the steam. It's removing the template where a lot of that chemistry happens. But what you see here is that very small amounts of alumina, even out after calcination, all the alumina we can detect is tetrahedral. And now that's true up to, say, maybe about 15%. But now, while we can make pure tetrahedral alumina up to 22% as synthesized, most of the alumina is octahedral after calcium. That's the case with C6. On the other hand, if we try to make somewhat wider cores, everything else being the same, what we observe now is only the 5% alumina stays tetrahedral. Already now at 15%, about, about half of the alumina is octahedral. It would appear that the that the smaller pores are stabilize the tetrahedral environment of the lumen. And again, I could show you the whole series, but I'll just show you one more. This is C6, C8, and now we're up to C10. And at C10, even with 5% aluminum, some of the lumen is coming out. So it's very clear that, that there is something unique about the smaller pores. You can stabilize the tetrahedral environment. And of course, that you might expect that to have an effect on the acidity. And so now, this is what we were originally after, which is this correlation of acidity with pore diameter. I told you about some of the complications, not all of which we resolved. But crudely speaking, we do see the effects that we were interested in. Uh, that is to say, uh, here I've used as my measure of acidity, there's a, there are two methyl shifts, which gives you dimethylbutane, which is, really takes a lot of acidity. That's, that's what's plotted here. In, uh, in red, I guess it is. And the three methyl, uh, two pentene, that's one methyl shift. And here I've just looked at the initial rate, that's what I0 is. But, but in any case, there's a little difference out here at the large pores, but it sort of goes to a minimum. And then when we make very small pores, the acidity short shoots up. And probably the primary reason there is just the stabilization of the tetrahedral environment. Though what we were interested in, and we still are interested in, is trying to correlate that acidity with, with, with structure. And, and there may still be something to that. When you try to make these hexagonal pores, and then you, you fit in how many geometric, how many zigs you can around there, uh, if you were making 40 angstroms, you can squeeze in seven, six, or five, well, no, seven and six, and so on. And actually, you can understand qualitatively the acidity in terms of of these most stable uh, bond negatives. Presumably, other things being equal, geometry is going to try to move you towards 109 degrees at that equal angle. And, and so the sort of largest angle you can get uh, uh, in, in, and still geometric fill this in might be the one you want to plot against acidity. I, I'm not going to press that because, because, because it's it's, it's more complicated than that also. When you, when you change the radius of curvature, there's been a, a Monte Carlo uh, study that came out of Mobile which shows that in these walls, you actually have ring structures of the silica or silica alumina and that compose, that not only move around the pore, but that are in the wall. And the size of those ring structures, which also affects the bond angle, is affected by this radius of curvature of the pore. So it's, 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 it's more complicated. Now, let me go back to the, the most acidic material we have. That's the C6 preparation, which has about 15 angstroms. And you don't have to think about it too long to understand that there, there might be a problem there. Once you get the alkyl chain length that small, there's the chance that you're all not only making micelles that are templates for the structure, but they also may be molecular templates. And so you can, you can imagine that you're getting some uh, crystalline impurities. Uh, the ZSM5 one, it's not the ZSM5, but the 11 or 20 or one of those that, that is, is, is one that actually is made in rather high quantities if you adjust the temperature and pH right in the same environment. And, and, and so one has to worry about whether the high acidity has not to do with either the stabilization of the tetrahedral uh, site and the mesoporous material or the bond angles, but just because I put in a little zeolite impurity. Certainly, it's harder to make these materials, as I've said, crystalline when you make small pores. Uh, here is, these are x-ray diffraction at small angles, and we see the, the, the uh, primary diffraction for the hexagonal array and, and some overtones for that when we have the larger pores. 
But that sort of goes away, and in fact, we can barely see any diffraction at all when we get out to see six. These are just less structured materials. We've tried to look for the, uh, the impurity content of zeolites by just making up mixtures where we actually put impurities in. And by the infrared, we thought we could set an upper limit of not more than 1% of a crystalline impurity uh, by looking at specific bands. The other way we try to do it is by x-ray diffraction, and I'll just show you those results. So if we take the C6 material and put 10% DSM-5, we can very clearly detect the, the diffraction of the DSM-5. If we mix in 1%, I say we can still detect it. But when we look at our material, we can't detect it, nor can we see any difference between the C6 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So within the, uh, the limits of these physical techniques, we can't detect any impurities. What we're in the process of doing now is trying to, to ascertain uh, what level of a crystalline material would you have to have in order to sort of fudge the results that we see. I think, we, I, I think in fact, uh, uh, we're still OK. One, because I think it will take probably more than a few tenths of percent to get the order of magnitude change rate. But the other thing is, uh, when, when Exxon first developed the 2-pentene as the method of, of uh, looking at acidity, they noted that the, the, the parameters having to do with pre-exponential factor and activation energy are very different for strong zeolite acids <coughs> than for amorphous materials. So that the activation energy in amorphous silica aluminum for these reactions is order 6 to 10 kilocalories, and for zeolites, it's of order 15 to 20. So I think that on those two grounds, we'll, we're going to be able to say that the change in acidity we've seen is real in the sense that it depends on the core diameter, either because of these bond angles or the stabilization of tetrahedral, and not a tetrahedral site, and not due to an impurity that we've, we've introduced. But <coughs> it's not complete. So that's sort of the end of story one, and I only have 10 minutes, I guess, to or less to do story two. Uh, but let me quickly go through that. So now we're going to change away from trying to look, use these materials as reference materials to try to learn something new about correlations between structure and acidity to the, another system, which is platinum and L zeolites, to try to say something about the poor diameter's effects on the metal wall interaction. And so I just remind you that L zeolite is a parallel pore structure, just like these mesoporous materials. Uh, and it has uh, undulating pores. We're looking down those parallel pores that have windows of about 7.1 angstroms that widen to about 13 angstroms or less, depending on the cation in there. So in that sense, they are the same as, as they look very much like uh, these materials. The interest in these materials is that, that they, if you put in, in hexane, you have you have a high selectivity for, for benzene. And the original interpretation of this that Pauster and Steger proposed was that it, it, it had to do with transport, uh, that, that, that the in-hexane traveling in the parallel channel is more likely to have an in-on collision and therefore give you thermal absorption and therefore give you a one six ring closure. Their evidence for, for that was that the side reaction with cracking would be more likely to give you terminal cracking. And so that, that if they looked at what they call the terminal cracking index, that the sum of the pentanes over the sum of the benzene, that cracking index would be high for things that gave you high selectivity benzene and low for things that, that didn't. And in fact, that's true. But of course, it could be that whatever else, whether it's metal support interaction, uh, it gives you this selectivity, also affects the secondary reaction. So it, it certainly doesn't prove it. There were other geometric interpretations of this. Uh, one of which came from Eric de Rome that said the non-binding interaction of the intexane with an active site environment lead to a pre-organization of the intexane, a, a pseudocycle in, in the precursor. In any case, I, I don't believe this, and, and I think most other people now have been convinced that that's probably not what's going on. It's not just geometric. One of the arguments against it is you put an intexane in, in an l 0 like 4 the number of conformers you can get is large, and there are not any of them that would be thermodynamically stable if you stressed it out. It, it, it just wouldn't work out that way. Another interpretation, also coming from Exxon, this is from Enrique Iglesias, is that what's really different about platinum vanilla zeolite is the fact that it stabilizes the small particles against the activation. He's doing in hectic. So, toluene, the initial uh, turnover rates are not much different at the 
beginning of the reaction or after, after the end of the reaction in the case of the alzeolite. But if you have the same platinum on silica, it's essentially uh, uh, dead. And, and so uh, his uh, interpretation of this, what's unique about the alzeolite is it stabilizes the platinum against deactivation by carbon deposition. And the idea there was that, the, that, that, that those carbon deposition reactions are bimolecular, and so I have a constraint. There's not enough room to make the bimolecular precursor to, to make the coke. So again, it was a geometric argument. The problem with that is there are a lot of other properties of the L-zeolite which are hard to fit into a simple geometric argument. Perhaps the one that's most difficult to argue geometric is their susceptibility to solvers. The, the effects of sulfur on these materials is to call migra cause migration and sintering. And they're very susceptible. Ordinary reformers might operate at a few parts per million. But in order to do inhexane to, to benzene, uh, <coughs> you have to get the uh, sulfur down in the parts per billion range. And what is being shown here is the activity, if you look at selectivity, yeah. again from exon, uh, conversion as a function of time, when you had a really clean feed, nil sulfur, and it sort of hangs up there. And then what happens when you put in 50 parts per billion by weight, 100 parts per billion, and 200? So there's nil, 50, 100, and 200. And you can show that what's happening here is that when you have sulfur, you mobilize the platinum, it moves out of the pores and makes large particles. So how can you explain that uh, structure? On the other hand, if you look at an interaction with platinum and, and uh, stabilizing it by interacting with the wall, conjure up a fairly good story about how that's the case. So, uh, and, and, I, and, 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 and of course, I've already reviewed, revealed my prejudice that I think it has to do with a platinum interaction with the wall. We try to get some information on that by using this toluene benzene uh, competitive uh, uh, hydrogenation from which you can extract the absorption equilibrium uh, constants. And what you can see is that there is a systematic change in that property as a function of, of uh, the acidity. So that if we look at something that's very acidic, like a cerium Y, that number is high. If we look at something that is essentially neutral platinum on silica, this is a number that came from literature. This is our number for measuring that. And then if we make these more and more basic, there's a continuum. So that certainly there's a correlation between this measure of essentially the electronic richness of the platinum particle and the kind of support that we thought. Well, all of that was things that we've been working on in the past. So what I wanted to do now is to take these mesoporous materials, synthesize them with the same silica aluminum ratio as, as the L-zeolite, exchange them to make them potassium so that they are compositionally the same as L-zeolite, but now be able to vary the pore size. 15 angstroms and 22 angstroms, the only ones we have done. So here we have platinum and KL, seven angstroms, that's the window size, that one. Platinum MCM41, potassium exchange, C6 uh, alkyl preparation, 15 angstrom, C10 preparation, 22 angstrom. And let's, uh, we have hydrogen semi-absorption and various other things, but, but we can look at three, look at the different ways. We can look at the initial rate of deactivation, and we can also look at the rate of regenerated ones. We can look at uh, them at the same benzene, sorry, benzene rate production at different times on the stream by 40, 400 minutes. Benzene rate at the same conversion, either low or high, or benzene rate at the same degree of deactivation. No matter which way we look at it, we get the same result. Platinum zeolite with a small pores is best. It has the highest activity at the same degree of activation, or at the same degree of conversion, or at the same uh, time on stream. And in each case, it monotonically gets worse as we make the pores larger. Uh, so this doesn't prove anything, but, but, but it does suggest that it may be that that radius of curvature that is being varied by the pore size is affecting the metal particle interaction. And it, it, and it has to. The question is whether it's reflecting the metallicness. Because if I, there's both a geometric and a sort of uh, radius of curvature effect. One is that if I put a platinum on a flat surface, the interaction area is very small. And as I wrap it to make the pore, <coughs> I just cover, I get more interaction. That's one effect. The other, the other one is that the surface free energy of the, of the surface is changed by changing the radius of curvature. And both of those effects should affect the degree of metal 
wall interaction. And perhaps that's what's going on here. But we certainly need to worry about transport effects. So it's hard to argue how transport and other things get worse when you get larger particles. It's going the wrong direction. So what we're doing at the moment is filling in other sizes in between here. Uh, we can do a C8, and we can do out here C12, and it looks like things are not going to change much after that. We can also look at other parallel channel zeolites, mostly the, of the alpha kind, that fit between 7 angstroms and 15 angstroms. And, and so that's the direction that we're moving in. I see I'm over time. I have a set of conclusions, but I'm going to skip, skip those and not come to any conclusions and just Put up this last one, which I must do, which is the people I need to thank. But a student who's done the vast majority of this work is Xiao Bing Ting, who's completed this work uh, just a couple months ago, is now a postdoctor with Yi Paul. The most recent work on platinum supported in these materials is done by Wei Fei Chu. And then we have the three Li's. Uh, these, they're all from Korea. These two were in my, my laboratory as a visiting professor and a postdoc. And then another Li who did a lot of the uh, uh, diffraction and the electron microscopy <coughs> on samples we sent back to Korea. Okay, so I want to thank all of those and DOE and SciTech uh, for their support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
along the periodic table and I have yet stronger interactions, I see an effect on activation. Now, I think the interactions with walls of something like silicon aluminum are much weaker than either of these reducible ones. So my guess is I'm not going to see anything as clear cut as a change in activation. It's going to be more subtle. questions?